Hey, Paratopia, guess what? We're back. <laughs> it's Jeff and Jeremy. And here we are with the first inaugural episode of our user-generated content episodes. Correct, Jeremy? That's right. Jody Heckman, a.k.a. Mudhog, from our message board. Interviewing... Mudhog. Always start off the great Mudhog. Yes. <laughs> Interviewing one Dale Graff. One of the uh, higher ups, creators, the architects behind Project Stargate. Cool. And that would be the psychic spying program, the remote viewing program featured in The Men Who Stare at Goats. goats. Yes. And um, I thought this was a a great way to start off because we we hit on a whole bunch of topics uh, that we've hit on uh, in Paratopia's past. Mm -hmm. And... um, I'll tell you just right off the bat, I'm already learning what, you know, not to take for granted, such as, hey, when you're recording, make sure you're in an enclosed area where there aren't, say, birds and dogs and oh. on Xbox. <laughs> that's right. I did hear a little uh, chatter there. But that's okay. Our, our listeners can overlook that. It's, it's a great guest and it's a great interview. And, uh, and, and Jody did a fantastic job, I think. Indeed he did. A little too much Jeremy Vaney, but that's okay. Well, uh, you can never have too much <laughs> Jeremy Vaney. No, I, I think, uh, I mean, I held back yeah. until the end. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but it's, it's very good. And uh, Well, and I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's, it's good for another reason, too, because I think it shows the possibilities of this new format. Um, because we'd been talking before about just having people do their own stories, um, and that's certainly an option, but here, here we have, um, you know, an interview with a real dude, <laughs> right. a real higher up in this whole, uh, remote viewing thing. So, uh, I think over the course of the next three weeks, you're going to see three very different types of shows and they're all going to illustrate the possibilities, the myriad possibilities that you, the listener have it at your disposal to create your own show. Right, right, and we didn't uh, we didn't secure this guest either. Jody secured this guest, so we didn't even, we didn't have to do anything except uh, you record didn't it. Have right? to do anything? Well, <laughs> <laughs> bastard. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jody secured this guest uh, on his own. So, and that's great. And if if anybody out there can do that, then of course we encourage that because <laughs> uh, that means uh, you know you're you're doing a little bit of legwork on your own, which is great. But uh, I think we've mentioned before, if, if anybody out there, uh, you know, in the audience land wants to interview anyone in particular, we'll certainly help you. So please drop us an email, paratopiapodcast at gmail.com, and we will do our best to set something up and get a communication going between you, us, and whatever guest you'd like to talk to. So I think that would be a, I think that would be a great way to, to, to kind of get people further engaged in doing this. Um, so, you know, these next three or four, listen to them and think about who you'd like to interview and we'll set it up. Without further ado, Jody Heckman and Dale Graff. Hello, fellow Paratopians, Jeff and Jeremy. This is uh Mudhog or Jody Heckman. I'm sitting here with Dale Graff or Graff. Now it's Graff in this part of the country. So I'll go with Graff. Okay. Um, Dale uh, is from the area here where I'm from, and I uh, synchronistically ran into him several times, uh, and Paratopia needed some shows from the listeners to put on, so I thought, I don't believe in synchronicities, it happened for a reason, so I talked to him, and he was more than happy to sit down here and go over his experiences and what he did. Um, He has a background in uh, aeronautical engineering. He is a physicist. He was the director of Stargate. Um, the last few years of its existence, and Stargate was the DIA 
and the CIA's Psychic Spy Program or the Remote Viewing Program. Um, it's recently become famous due to the recent movie Men Who Stare at Goats. Today, Dale's doing lectures. He has a couple of books out. He does seminars on his experiences, pursuing dreams, and he's just starting to get interested in poltergeist activity, which I found out from listening to him on Coast to Coast in February. Okay. Hey, great. That's a nice summary. I, I'll try to remember that myself. <laughs> did I miss anything? Do you want to add anything? It'll come up, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. Don't forget, I'm a wilderness canoeist. I right. spent a lot of time in Canada uh, canoeing the white water of the Arctic. That, now, how that relates to this topic, I'm not sure. I just thought I'd toss it in. <laughs> how did you get interested in, and I'll use your term, Psy? Okay. Why don't we define Psy first? Okay, right. Um, from the research side of this phenomenon, there is a generic label called Psy, P-S-I, uh, which is the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet, and it was coined in the 1940s in England to represent a neutral way of talking about psychic phenomena. Um, that way, the researchers and people that read the reports didn't have to try to figure out what the terminology really meant from a functional point of view. For example, uh, clairvoyance, the old word that actually has been replaced by a newer term, remote viewing, um, but in the early part of the century, in, in the 1900s, it, it really referred to clear seeing. Um, and there were other things going on in England at the time that made the researchers think they should create a more generic term so you didn't have to assume what caused the phenomenon, whether it's vision or something else. So a sigh is an umbrella term for a lot of different types of psychic phenomena. How did you become personally interested in what? Well, I've been interested in the topic by different labels uh, for a long time. Uh, growing up here in Pennsylvania, uh, there was always the, uh, the the herbalist, the the hex doctor, uh, the people that went around looking for herbs in the mountains. And you know, I heard about my grandmother talking about those things. I never took them seriously uh, at the time. And then when I arrived in elementary school and high school, I really pretty much put that aside that there's really not much to that stuff. I thought it was an uh, old wives' tale, superstition. Although I have to admit, I did have uh, some precognitive experiences as a child, although I didn't really have the word for it at the time. Uh, growing up on a farm uh, right outside of Hamburg, I would sometimes have a sense or even a dream uh, about people that would be visiting, that there was no way we could predict who they really were. So I, I was kind of alerted to the fact that there was intuition at work. And my aunt and even my mother, to some extent, had an intuitive uh, hand, so to speak, and could sense things, although we never really talked about it openly. So that kind of got my interest, but I, I put it aside until much later, until after I got out of college and started working for a living on the space programs, uh, and things happened there that made me realize that uh, from people I had talked to, I got to meet people that were into healing. Uh, I, I met one of the best healers in the country, uh, Olga Worrell. I lived in Baltimore at the time. Uh, and so I, I got to see that there, there were things that were beyond what physics and engineering could define. So that's sort of how my interest began. You had an interest in your intuitive experiences. Yes. But yet you went to school for physics, which right. I would imagine probably was... Really quite diverse. I'd be, I was very interested in oh, philosophical things when I was a kid in high school. And um, I think what drove me into engineering, uh, I have a degree in aeronautical engineering, and I spent 10 years in the aerospace industries uh, on the early space programs, the Gemini, the, and, of course, the big Titan booster, the ICBM, and other missile programs. But... I became interested in aviation during World War II. I was a kid then, and something about the science of flight caught my fancy and my attention. In fact, even today as we sit here, a B-17 flew over. There's a big air show going on in Reading, Pennsylvania. See, I'm out in the yard today looking at this beautiful World War II airplane that I built a model on. Uh, that got me interested in the concept of flight, of, of the spirit soaring, so to speak. So I decided to do something practical. I went to engineering school, but I still had this this deep desire to learn more 
uh, about what what we are, what's consciousness, what's the mind. I had that sort of creeping around in my subconscious mind even when I was in high school, although I, I didn't have a chance to get into it until many years later. Could you, like, as you're working on rocket booster motors and all this other stuff, could you talk to anybody about precognition, intuition, ESP? Uh, good question. Uh, my colleagues certainly didn't have a lot of interest in the topic. And I, I did, at that time, I really wasn't pursuing it much myself. But there were a few coincidences that happened that made me uh, take another look at it. I tried to talk with some of my colleagues, and they really uh, weren't interested in it. So I really had to keep it to myself and not do anything about it until many years later um, mm -hmm. when I actually left the aerospace industries and joined the Foreign Technology Division, which is part of the Air Force, and Wright Patterson Air Force Base you know, in technical intelligence. And there I met some people that had an interest in it. So for the first time, I was really able to talk to people that, that at least were interested in the topic, even though they weren't actively uh, psychics or doing anything in it. Uh, so it was nice to have someone to talk to, but that really wasn't what stirred up my ultimate interest in the topic. It, it really came from experiences. Um, I had some very traumatic experiences in wilderness canoeing accidents, uh, you might say. I had a severe case of hypothermia one time, um, severe weight loss, and these traumatic incidents seemed to open up my dream mind. And whenever or after these episodes, I found that I could recall dreams very easily. They just came spontaneously. And with the dreams came precognitive experiences. And I was about 37, 38 years old now when all this began. And uh, this activity really threw me in, into a study of the field. And uh, a few years later, I uh, became involved in the research in part of the Stargate program and became involved with what was called remote viewing research at the Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park. And that's how I really moved into the Stargate activities and looking at what we call remote viewing uh, from a scientific point of view and also from an application point of view. Uh, how could technical intelligence and how could operational intelligence benefit from people that had this ability? I heard you say from these traumatic experiences being um, profoundly hypothermic and the weight loss um, makes me think of, I've heard other people say that they've had near-death experiences and after that their lives changed because of whatever they experienced. Uh, a, a connection there um, puts us in touch with our soul, our consciousness? or I think what happens when we have these experiences, we, we, we realize that there's more to ourselves than what we are taught. And it's unfortunate that there, that we need to be actually thrown into such a traumatic situation in order to have that realization. Uh, when you're looking at ultimate things, when it looks like you're about to die, uh, then you begin to relax your hold on this reality. And when you relax that hold, other kinds of experiences come in. And these are not hallucinations. They're not because the brain is starved of, of oxygen, like some of the critics say. It's, 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 you're linking with some higher reality, I think, some, some you know, higher degree of consciousness, transpersonal, uh, even spiritual uh, to some extent. Uh, so that's what happens when you have these traumatic uh, episodes. But how can you really talk about them afterwards? So it's very difficult. But I did the next best thing. I discussed and researched and explored phenomenon that seemed to come along with it. Uh, increased intuition, increased creativity, uh, in very detailed precognitive dreams. So this is all linked to this shock to my, to my system. And I'm not unique here. I've talked to a lot of people that have had these kinds of experiences. Uh, it's unfortunate that most people have to have this dramatic uh, episode in order for them to realize it. So you might say I had the experiences and then I moved on from there and then try to understand them in the context of what we now know in physics and uh, re relate that to whatever I could from the metaphysical side. Uh, there's a lot of material in the New Age community that sort of fits in. I didn't go or didn't really accept everything that was out there, but I, I looked at what was relevant to my experiences and I tried to blend some of those perceptions with what I was experiencing.
Uh, and I felt it was a good balance because I could look at the the uh, natural sciences and I could also look at the metaphysical world uh, without getting too caught up in either one of those and, and just try to figure out what was going on. What'd you come up with? I can't, yeah, I'd say, <laughs> listen, I'm still trying to come up with it. But fundamentally, I think what I've come up with is that there really is a lot of overlap between uh, amongst or whatever a variety of experiences and people give them different names uh, and some names are turn off names uh, other names seem to be that they're too general uh, but but I found that there really was a, a kind of consciousness that we all have which is usually not called upon we can we can run into it in a dream state we can run into it in other altered states and you know we finally ended up seeing that there's a, there's a large or a universal type of connectivity uh, between minds. And I use the term mind and not brain because I no longer think that the, the brain equals the mind. That there's some aspect of the mind that, or the brain that links to a, a greater mind. Uh, you can call it the collective unconscious or global consciousness or transpersonal consciousness, whatever term you want to use. The, the meaning behind it is that it's more than what we can access and what we really are as defined by our, our brain. That, that our brain connects with it. Uh, and once we connect with this, this greater sense of consciousness and we blend that with our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in my view, we can live a, a more integrated and more balanced life, even though we may not fully understand the full implications of it. So not the first time I've heard that. Huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, from some of the podcasts from the show, yeah. listening to um, some of the uh, indigenous people oh, okay. talking about rational mind and, and yeah. the, you know, irrational and, and help me out, Jeremy, like Teokasen. Uh, yeah. Talking about the difference between indigenous mind and the hierarchical thinking. Um, and it yeah. was confusing to me at first. I, I assumed he meant by indigenous mind, tribal mind, but he didn't. He meant more the quote-unquote enlightened state or uh, something along those lines. Um, yeah, is, is that what you were getting at, Jody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Kogi and um, Teokasen, they're the people that live more uh, connected to nature rather than separated from nature. I, I kind of hear uh, Yes, I think, yeah, I also had this, this uh, striving to travel in the wilderness, um, I, th I think that also added to my experiences and to my understanding of this connectivity. Uh, and, and in fact, some of my travels in the Arctic uh, were almost like uh, uh, vision quests. You know, I never used that term, but being out there in this tundra and struggling uh, on a wild river for three or four weeks, you really do become connected with something that's way beyond uh, what we can comprehend. And maybe that's what you mean by this indigenous connection. Uh, there's, I've, I've read some of the works of the shamans, and this is an amazing correlation between the shaman's journey and some of the things that I, some of my colleagues have experienced that, that I've since met um, that are also interested in, in this field. And even to a, a very limited extent, some of the things that I've experienced, although I would never claim to be a shaman, I, I certainly can relate to some of their experiences. Uh, and I think the wilderness setting really prepares you for that kind of uh, that kind of experience. And it's not as frightening as it's not as uncomfortable when it does happen because it's it's in that naturalistic framework. So I can understand that, where the, why the indigenous people relate to this so well. Do you think that the two minds are compatible, or do you think that one is uh, structural and the other is, ant well, anti-structural to the structure, I guess, not unto itself? Um, I think, yeah. yeah, okay, I think I know, I understand your question. The, uh, the Our brain uh, does have two major functions, the, uh, the, the logical deductive side, and the intuitive holistic side. So in, in a way, we already are in that direction of having what looks like incompatible capability, um, the intuitive and the logic. And I think the moving in, into this collective sphere, they're not incompatible. But they deal with different kinds of information and it's presented differently. Um, and one of the difficulties we had 
in the remote viewing program was to, to actually interpret the information. And this is why we went into a regime of only sketch what you perceive, because once you start trying to interpret it, you will probably go wrong. <laughs> so the names that we put on things and the, the, how we want to categorize them, uh, we start de deviating from the raw information. Uh, so the basic impulse is more of a gestalt, more of a pattern, a more of a waveform. And what we then try to do with it in rational engineering language is to try, try to define it in a linear, uh, logical manner. Then they appear to be incompatible, but, but they don't need to be. There can be a mutual interlocking uh, between them to, so that they can be work, they can work together. And I think this is one of the big big motivations of biofeedback back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. People actually did try to coordinate the, um, the, the left and the right hemisphere through biofeedback machines. So that was a step in that direction. Uh, I don't see them as incompatible, um, but they are they require different modes of thinking and, 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 and how to interpret them. I think you have to have a balance. Yeah. It's kind of like the yin yang, the man, woman, the yeah. rational, irrational, left brain, right brain. Balance is a good word. And in fact, right now, I'm putting together a paper for a presentation next week in Boulder, Colorado, to the Society for Scientific Exploration. And the title of my paper is Kundalini, a consciousness field effect. Now, Kundalini is the term from the Hindu yoga traditions having to do with this energy that's perceived to emanate from the spine and, and uh, surge upward through the spine and create uh, all kinds of uh, activity and, and higher awakenings and, and uh, merging with creativity and, and uh, uh, improving health and whatever it is. It's part of the energy system that's perceived from that culture. Uh, how real that energy is, I'm not sure, but, but it's a felt energy. And it seems to relate to some of the experiences that I've heard people mention, particularly from the, uh, the Native American community, uh, and uh, to some extent, some of the things I felt. So I'm trying to blend uh, this experience uh, from a different culture and trying to put language to it that colleagues in the engineering and physics world can understand. So uh, it's going to be a real challenge next week. But I, I, I think I can do it. I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> See well, what happens. Even, even uh, on those terms, I mean, now that you mentioned Kundalini, this is something that I've been told is what's going on with me. I have some sort of energy that makes me do Tai Chi, whirling dervish twirls, oh, all yeah. this sort of stuff. And yeah. uh, that happens instantaneously when I click off my normal sense of self. Yeah. This yeah. other self or whatever it is, energy takes over. So yeah. even along those lines, it's like these two minds are not compatible. It's like having two operating systems in your body. Um, so what do you I, what do you do I with think, that? Well, it, the um, yeah, it's blatant in in the um, yoga concepts. The energy is potentially there, uh, and many times or most of the time, it sort of is applied or comes into awareness in a very gradual manner, and you're not aware of these sensations and in, in the situations that it can stir up. It's, it's only when we, according to the theory, is resisted or have a, a long way to go to redevelop it, so to speak, because in principle, it's, it's been there since birth. Uh, it's only then when these things seem to be incompatible and require uh, this feeling uh, response. Uh, so I don't see them as, as being incompatible. Uh, it's just that it's a matter of accepting them and applying them in a more naturalistic, comfortable style. Uh, so uh, I, I don't I don't really see it as something of a different operating system, like you mentioned. It's there all the time. It's only the rate of change which makes it more apparent, I would think. If you, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that's that's an interesting okay. way to put it. Uh, so yeah. I, I guess the way I would think of it then is that there's always this other energy or the, the, the larger energy that trickles down yeah. through yeah. you, whether you're aware of it or not. And so it's just sort of opening yeah. the floodgates is the difference. That's about what it is. It just increases the volume. Go to your system and turn up the, the juice, so to speak. But there's always something there, uh, and it, according to the theories, having to do with prana, the life force. Uh, but I think it can also be related to 
um, our own body physiology and our uh, metabolism rates. There's got to be a link between the two. Uh, what this particular energy is, I don't think anyone can really say. Uh, it, it is a felt energy. Uh, in the Hindu tradition, it's only the beginning of a process that then uh, ascends and enters the um, head area. The third eye is a term they use for the intuitive side of us that then becomes more energized and then rises even further into what's called the crown at the very top, where in principle it connects with this higher consciousness uh, in a state of nirvana. Nirvana has reached. Samadhi is the term used. Uh, so a lot of people actually go this full route, but it might take years. People in our culture usually stop short of that, uh, and it's, but it's still a gain because we end up not only having higher creativity, we do seem to have more energy, and we also seem to be uh, more balanced in our physical makeup and therefore have a better well, uh, health and wellness profile. Uh, and, and in fact, I've known people that hardly ever get sick, that they just simply call on or expect this feeling, this energy to build up within them and to become their own self-healer. Uh, something we really need at this time <laughs> in our culture to, to be better off uh, in our own bonus maintenance. Yeah, I own, think part of the confusion yeah. of this stuff is that um, you can in some way control it or you can... For instance, if it awakens um, psychic ability in you, it's easy to yeah. then hone in on that and, and go, yeah. okay, I'm going to be a psychic or something. But if you yeah. just let it go, I think that what it is, is it's preparing the body, the mind, all of that uh, for this enlightenment, God consciousness, whatever you want to call it. But it, So yeah. it has to get the, the body and everything else healthy first. And so I think with yeah. a guy like me who has no background in any of this, yeah. it's making me do exercise primarily, and it's making yeah. you know, I'm a fat guy, so it's like, okay... <laughs> You're going to get in shape first, and then we're going to take that next step. But that's an interesting that's an interesting point. But it does really focus on the well, the, the health and well being. And of course, we all know about the yoga, exercise, and posture. So getting the body in shape and in balance is fits right in with the wellness and the holistic movements in this country. And I can see why yoga is really taking off. Uh, different kinds and, and different versions. Just go to any bookstore and look at how many books there are available on different yoga practices. But in there is the emphasis on wellness and health. Uh, and of course, there's also the aspect you talked about, the ultimate uh, development of this connection with a, a transcendental consciousness, or what I might have said earlier, which is this, this global collective consciousness. Now, we have different words for this. And depending upon what culture you're in and what your background is, some words are foreign to you or to me. Uh, we all have sort of a, a understanding. Uh, we never really can come up with the exact word because how can you define something like this? But uh, it's in that direction of, of uh, a global interconnected um, higher consciousness. And uh, interestingly enough, I, what I've seen, there, there appeared to be a huge insert in Kundalini kinds of experiences in this country in the 70s. Uh, it's, 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 and these happen spontaneously. This did not come out of a yoga um, context. And people that had these experiences were totally befuddled. What's going on? You know, am I going nuts? Do I have to go to a psychiatrist or something like that? So how, why did this happen? And you know, I'm really curious about that, too, and I have no answer for that, except it may link to this collective unconscious growing and expanding, and then it's reaching down to people like you and me, because I fell into this too, uh, but I think it was more because of the trauma, but I can't say it was totally that. I think I was also doing a lot of soul searching, uh, if that's a good enough term here, um, even before then, so I was sort of opening myself psychologically, and then I got kicked in the butt, so to speak, from the, uh, the dr dramatic situations that I encountered in the river and on these, these, these uh, uh, canoe trips. So I often wondered why I was even in the wilderness in the first place. So it was almost like a, what the Native Americans would have called a, a vision quest, although that was not my purpose of going there. I just wanted to catch the, the largest uh, lake trout in anybody <laughs> <laughs> and cook it up at night and enjoy that. But instead, I ended up with maybe catching a bigger fish. Who knows? <laughs> 
Well, like you asked why you go out there. I'm, my yeah. my son and I go out in the woods all the time because it feels good. Yeah. You know, maybe there's an energy out there that you can tap into. I think it, it, it's a mirror thing. It, it reflects into us what's already within us. So it, it's kind of a mutual resonance there. And it brings out what's already dormant, just like this kundalini energy in principle uh, is dormant. Uh, or at least the dramatic parts of it, even though there's something cooking all the time, uh, and we just don't don't notice it. Uh, it. It all boils down to what really is the life force. What is the nature of life? What is consciousness? And these are some really tough questions. And in my recent activity, I'm looking at quantum physics because there is some really weird stuff in quantum physics that really defy any kind of logical explanation. So here, and even in physics, you have this split between the nice logical stuff and the stuff that just doesn't make a lot of sense, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> that's, how this can, yeah. that's why we're doing all this stuff right now from the, the uh, quantum effects of, of electronics, but it's going to get even more bizarre when quantum computers are developed. And those computers we, we rely on a principle called non-locality or quantum entanglement. Uh, a simple illustration is you have two charged particles that are coupled uh, in some technical term by charge or by spin or some other property, polarization, and you flip them away. You flip one to the other end of the universe, turn this one suddenly, and the other one responds instantaneously. Uh, that's called quantum synchronicity or non-locality. Now, computers, based on that principle, hardly need any moving um, product, parts. <laughs> and everything is happening through this non-local. It's like moving um, an electron through a lead wall, and it, it just goes right through, you know, unstoppable. So it, it's a phenomenon which is only in the recent decade or two really being taken seriously by physicists. And, and, is, and what's pushing it is the marketplace, because if you can build devices that operate on this principle, how can you worry about how to explain it? It, it just is. It happens. It's the way quantum physics works. You're going to take Dell and IBM off, though, because you won't have to replace computers. <laughs> and no moving parts. Hey, but, but what it does conceptually, it opens up the, the uh, language between the metaphysical community, the healing community, and the physics community, because now there's a common term, uh, entanglement. And it, go to any bookstore and look at the books out there. I just picked one up called Quantum Yoga. Can you believe that? Uh, where the writer has done a great job in explaining the whole history of dozens of yoga practices, but placing the, the philosophical or the cosmological framework in the in context of what quantum physics is saying uh, in terms of non-locality and, and entanglement. It may sound like a mishmash, but it really isn't. When you really get into it, it makes a lot of sense, at least from the Western perspective. And even some of the yoga practitioners, like Yogananda, some of the, some of the really big names from years ago, in trying to hand the principles of yoga into Western culture, saw that connection. They were, were already beginning to use terms from physics to show that this is really what some of those ancient uh, seers and yoga aesthetics were saying uh, back in the Himalayan mountains and, and the, the Hindus Valley 5,000 years ago. Uh, so it's, 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 it's like there's a, a coming together of the very ancient to the very modern. And it's really an exciting time, I think, right now. Uh, in, when you look at this, this, this development and, and this conceptual overlap between the old and the new, uh, it, it's really quite fascinating. And maybe I'm biased because of my physics background, but, but, but I found it really quite remarkable. But it's more than being remarkable from a philosophical or conceptual point of view. It's very practical, too. Because there's, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, there's the, the intuitive and the psi part, and there's also the healing wellness part that, that comes along with this. And uh, there's a lot here, and it's such a vast topic. And little did I realize back 
when I first became involved in remote viewing back in 1976, then I would end up doing stuff like this. <laughs> it's, become, it's becoming a way of life for me, and this is why I do workshops and seminars to try to explain to people how to how to rationalize, how to how to understand. I hate the word rationalize, but how to understand this connectivity. And more importantly, what it means to them personally. And it's not something out there that others do. It's, it's not that mysterious from the point of view, does it happen or not? It's mysterious from an exp explanation point of view, but not mysterious from a practical point of view. And, and try to show them that they're, in principle, no different than, than the greatest yoga that ever lived. They just have to open up to it. I hear you talking about... Uh yoga trying to explain rationally why it works and um, some of the stuff that I've been coming across is and that some of the podcasts from the show that I caught that stuck out and jumped out at me was how you've got these third world cultures and these indigenous people and the, the Native Americans how uh, they're I don't want to say they're not rational but uh, Psy is almost irrational, and and, irrational is a good word, yeah. and they've been doing this for thousands of years, yeah. and yeah. now we're trying to bridge this into rationality yeah. and merge it because I think we're at the point where so much of this is going on. So many people are having experiences of being more psychic after a canoe mm -hmm. accident mm -hmm. and having a Kundalini experience. Mm -hmm. it, science has been ignoring this because it's irrational, and okay. we're we're so rationally motivated. I think on this. Area yeah. of the earth. And the problem with science is, and I can speak here because that's my background. <laughs> I, I feel I can make a few uh, stabs in, in that direction. And I'm talking about classical conventional science, not a lot of my scientific colleagues. Uh, some, many of them are really very open to this and also are very intuitive. But first, we have to change the word. It's not irrational. It's non-rational. Mm -hmm. So we're looking right, at the right, rational right. and the non-rational. Although the critic will want to call it irrational, um, but that's his choice, and there are many critics. And the, the interesting thing that I see happening is even though conventional science still says psi does not exist, all these healing effects or illusion and so on, you know, you can go to the National Academy of Science and find these reports. I have them at home. I read them. I study them. And they're denying the reality of psi. That can only go on so long. But that's a good point. And what's going to happen is they're going to be overtaken by events. There's just too much happening in the general population. Uh, and particularly with young people coming on and seeing all this stuff, and they have access to it like you and I never did. I, I often wonder what I would have done had I been able to read some of the material that I eventually read uh, when I was a teenager. You know, it would have really had a big effect on me at that time. Uh, I'm happy I came into it later on in life. But we have this information flow. We have people that actually show the results, and they're not fakes, although there are many out there. You have to be very careful about that. Um, and then the key thing is to experience it themselves without being ridiculed. Uh, and that's an, another big step I see happening in, in many areas. Young people do talk about the experiences, their, their dreams, their intuitions, their psychic experiences, and they're not being left out of the, um, the kitchen table, away from the kitchen table, for example. So there's more of an acceptance going on right now. I think people science, are, yes, science will be lost in the dust. <laughs> I think people are empowering themselves more and waking up more and spending more time in the woods and listening to themselves more rather than listening to science tell them that it doesn't exist because they have the experience and they know it exists. And there is hope because in this group I'm talking to next week, they're really composed of high-level scientists. So here's a group that's really willing to listen to people like myself. And I'm not the only one on the agenda that's talking about science. There's healers on the agenda. Um, even though or the main topic of the conference is on advanced propulsion techniques and space warp drive, <laughs> you know, how, how to um, bend Einstein's um, curvature, yeah, that kind of thing. So that, that is, that's the scope of this program and that we'll be into next week in Boulder, Colorado. And then at the end of the month, I'm giving two presentations at the, the International Association for the Study of Dreams, uh, a very large organization, and they also are, for the first time, uh, and, well, in the past several years, uh, accepting the reality of precognitive and side dreams uh, and also healing dreams. 
So it's a very wonderful blend of psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors, people from the Harvard sleep laboratories, from the physiology groups around the country in academia, uh, blending with the artists uh, and people that actually have the experiences. So it, it's a wonderful mix of the experiential and the hard-nosed skeptic. Uh, which many of the medical people are uh, on the group, but they're listening and they're open to it. So these things are happening, and uh, it's a very positive sign. Um, they don't really need to have formal science coming out of the National Academy of Science in Washington, D.C. Put the sign on your door and says, Psi permitted here. <laughs> you don't need that. <laughs> you can ignore that and just accept it. So uh, it's, it's a very positive thing. Uh, but it has to be handled, too, with with some, with some uh, a, a good amount of, of ethics. You need, you need to be uh, concerned. You need to be careful. Um, you just don't go running around telling everybody this or you, you have to you have to pay attention to the audience. Uh, how much are they willing to understand? Um, how far are you going to take this? Well, how many, what claims can you make? Uh, so there are limits to, to what you and I can do. You know, we're not yet at the high guru stage in our lives, but we're getting there, I think. I don't know if I'll make it uh, before I run out of time, but I'll give it a shot. Um, you were talking about global consciousness mm-hmm. and, and being connected to a oneness, um, and I heard you mention, um, did you say Stanford? Yeah, uh, SRI. Yeah, SRI, Stanford Research Institute. I wanted to ask you, and I, I'm not, I don't want to debate Cliff Hire WebBot if it's valid or not, but what he, the premise that of what he's doing, are you familiar with WebBot and Cliff High? No. He believes that we are inherently psychic and that he can search the internet using, uh, he calls them spiders, it must be some type of software. I know what that is. That goes out and searches uh, yeah. word usage. Yeah. And he attaches an emotional value to the word usage. Mm-hmm. Like a carpet would have next to nothing and war or rape <clears throat> would have a high emotional value. Mm-hmm. Um, he believes that um, we are all psychic, and we don't know it, but based on the word usage that we use mm-hmm. and what people are writing about, mm-hmm. um, based on the emotional level that the conversations mm-hmm. and the interactions go to um, precede uh, major events, catastrophic oh, events. Okay. There might be something to that. Um, Look, MR, is it MIT has the random number generators that they believe spike? Like they spike right before 9-11. Yeah, okay. Um, well, the, um, this is that... Actually, at Princeton, that, okay. that's the, yeah, sure. That's the. Uh, in fact, I I just purchased one. I would, my next phase of research is actually working with, with one of these random event generator devices, and that's based on a quantum physics principle, uh, and with the idea that there is a global consciousness field that somehow is if you if you have random events in this electronic device. Um, as the field becomes more organized and less chaotic, it affects the, um, the the kind of output from in that device. So instead of it, it'll be a, it's a coin flipper. You either get all zeros or all ones in terms of electric current. Are you talking about influencing the machine yeah. or the machine knowing what the machine's going to do? No, it's in, it, it it influences the machine. Okay, but. The, the predictive ability from this comes with a precognitive aspect of the collective unconscious or the global consciousness field. So whatever that starts shifting and becoming less chaotic, you can see that in the random event generator. Mm-hmm. Right before 9-11, it became more organized. The output of the ray became more yes. organized. Then it peaked right at 9-11 and stayed there for a while. So there was something happening in this hypothetical global consciousness field. It may not be that hypothetical, but that's that's how you phrase it in, in uh, scientific terms. Uh, that somehow affected that field that then in turn interacted with this reg. Uh, and there, there are dozens of these, maybe hundreds by now, around the, the Earth in different countries. So the patterns that people are observing uh, are being integrated in, uh, in at Princeton in uh, in, a, in the new laboratory there ICRL uh, they call it and the, the attempt is to follow these trends to see whether or not they can predict some major situation like the tsunami uh, in, in Indonesia some time ago, three or four years ago. Yeah, so there, that work is going on. And I'm hoping I can, once I get more familiar with the with the technology and the software behind it, I'm hoping I can actually take this device into an area 
that's supposed to be haunted. You know, is, is there residual energy in a haunted house that might be energizing or um, organizing the collective field, whatever that means, that's in this the so-called house that's haunted? And, and it might be a way of, of seeing if there's something there that's residual. And it might back up the uh, claims of some of the poltergeist researchers, for example. Now, these are all things I'm looking at. Before we go down that road, um, one thing you said earlier, you don't believe the mind is in the brain, and I agree with you. Um, right. And you're talking about the Kundalini energy and, and energy that's uh, supposed to exist and it's there. Mm -hmm. But what if we have energy that's outside the body, like our mind is outside our brain? And that ties us into the consciousness field. Yes. It depends where we turn the knob to attune ourselves to that and be aware of it. Yeah, it's, it all depends where is mind. It's if I, I, I can accept the, the thesis that what's called mind is greater than the brain. So now where is that? You know, how do we connect to this greater mind? And this is what we've been talking about here. And you know, we can have theories from quantum physics that give us a hint of how this might work. But that's only a, a beginning concept. Uh, it just happens. You know, these are linking processes that are inherent in the, the mind-body-brain system. And they really are mysterious. You know, nobody can really explain them. We have hints, uh, but it, it is something greater than ourselves it's going somewhere. Where that is, I don't know. Is it an alternative dimension uh, you know, or a spiritual dimension? I don't know. All, all I can do is look at the data and, and wonder about it and, and just say, yeah, it's possible. Which it throws me into another question. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, talk about black matter and antimatter mm -hmm. and that we can only observe uh, a limited percentage, like mm -hmm. 4 or 7% mm -hmm. of our universe because so much of it exists mm -hmm. outside of our reality because it's antimatter or, or this dark matter or dark energy. There could be things around us in our reality that are here that we can't perceive or react to rationally or consciously mm -hmm. that maybe our mind and our the rest of our energy system could connect to if we were in tune with it. Yeah, I, you're right. The, um, the cosmologists are really having a problem with uh, how to really conceptualize dark energy and, and, and black energy, dark mass. Uh, <clears throat> it's there somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, what, what it does and what it means, it just seems to have an effect on gravity and, and how things move around in orbit. But where is it? Um, I don't know. No one really knows for sure. Um, so there are these energy sources, possibly, all around us. The other really key point here is the term from quantum physics called zero-point energy. Yeah, you, know, you don't even have to go into the dark energy and the um, dark mass of the universe to be, to be uh, befuddled. All you have to do is think about the concept of zero-point energy. Now, this comes out of quantum physics, and this is the, the hypothesized cosmic flux that exists at extremely small dimensions. Uh, the term used is the Planck scale, named, named after Max Planck, the individual that really set the, the framework for quantum physics, 10 to the minus 23 centimeters. You get that small, and the universe looks like it's a continual bubbling foam of energy. And so much energy in a micro, micro, micro centimeter of, of space, or volume of space, cubic centimeter, that it would be enough to power the, the entire Earth for a, a, a year. But how do you tap that? You know, so th this is something that's not even the, the dark matter or the dark energy out there. Uh, this is something that's in the quantum scale of where we right, are right now. It's right here in front of me. It's right there. It's, it's in, in you. It, it's, it's, it sounds mysterious, and it is, but it's in the quantum physics. It, it can be shown to be potentially uh, there, uh, this, this uh, zero-point energy, at the zero point. So maybe uh, years from now, decades uh, we don't have to worry about oil. We'll just tap into the ZBE. <laughs> That's how long it'll take for the beaches to clear up. Anyway. Yeah, I like to tap into that. We really get a great pattern going.
Yeah. yeah, in fact, I've even seen devices sold in the new age storage called the zero point energy applicator because they have no idea what zero point energy really means. And, and so people buy the stuff, uh, whatever it is. It's some crystals in there that might be useful, but it's not zero point energy. <laughs> That's called salesmanship. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything, Jeremy? Yeah, uh, I just want to go back to something you said earlier about uh, how important it is to watch yourself when you're presenting this. And, well, I, I, I guess I just got to ask, given probably what you know about ufology, how do you feel about remote viewing having, having been sort of co-opted by ufology? There's a number of people in that were former, formerly connected with the uh, Stargate unit and um, that became very active in some of the UFO um, concepts um, that they're not really a part of the official remote viewing community. So in, in a way, they have, like you say, um, co-op or whatever, that. And I don't really follow that too much, but I think they're, they're, they've gone way overboard, and what their statements just cannot be... Uh, uh, relied on, so I, I uh, really d don't have a lot to say there, uh, other than uh, we need to be cautious about what they're saying. So, who uh, would you trust? Like, if you were to say, "Okay, go buy this book on remote viewing," who would the author be? Right now, there are not too many. Um, uh, Paul Smith wrote a good a good summary of the program. Um, Courtney Brown has a reasonable book out. Um, my two books touch into it in a general sense. You want to plug your books real quick? Oh, yeah, I do have two books, but I'm not going to say they're out there to have the final word on remote viewing because I also blend in dreams and synchronicity. Uh, I focus on three things in my books. The remote viewing from a very basic point of view, um, precognitive dreams, part of the dreaming um, world, and uh, synchronicities, which I think is a, is a way in which our intuitive nature uh, allows or affects our actions to lead, lead to a positive results. Like finding the book that you were looking for and had no idea where it was until you bumped into a friend that had it, stuff like that in, in a synchronistic sense. So my books look into that. I have another book called, that book is called Tracks in the Psychic Wilderness. The other book I have is called River Dreams, uh, because it was going to be part of a larger series, uh, which I'm still working on. But that book looks also at remote viewing from an operational point of view, because in it, I discuss some of the operational projects that we had in the Stargate program, the search for General Dozier, looking for uh, hostages, looking for crashed airplanes, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a very practical example of remote viewing. Um, it, but there's other than maybe some of the websites, I can't really think of really one good book out there, one book that does everything, you know. Uh, there are some training manuals out there available. Um, but some of the websites through the uh, IR, through IRBA, the International Remote Viewing Association, would be a good place to start. Well, you mentioned um, Courtney Brown, and I know his that the two books that I have by him were you know, very much alien-related uh, stuff. Does he have another book that's... That yeah, the one the one that's reasonable is the, the one called Remote Viewing. Uh, uh, the earlier ones really did go, I thought, overboard on the alien in the... Uh, uh, what was that incident that happened back 10 years ago with that cult, uh, the Hill Bop. Right, the Heaven's Gate yeah. cult. Yeah, Heaven, that's it, Heaven's Gate, yeah. So um, I wouldn't... I wouldn't want to recommend those two books unless you really want to look into the history of that uh, that that material. They were. But, I read them. They're entertaining. The, the, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. I was, I was groping for yeah, that word. Yeah. Well, how closely for... knit is the remote viewing? I mean, is there a remote, remote viewing community? Is it closely knit? I mean, do you talk to each other? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the URBA, the International Remote Viewing Association, is a fairly tight knit group. In fact, there's a conference coming up in a few weeks in Las Vegas. Um, and it's, I'd say it's a well-balanced organization. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't cater to just anyone that wants to talk about remote viewing. You have to show that it's incredible stuff you're doing 
So I, I would say it's, it's a, the only one out there that really is, is attempting to uh, establish a credibility for the field. Unfortunately, there are other people that are not connected with IRBA, the International Remote Viewing Association, that are making wild claims, and some of them overlap into the UFO community. And I would recommend staying away from those unless you really wanted to study the history of what they were doing, just from that point of view. Have you ever asked any of, any of the folks who promote the, the UFO stuff about what they're doing? Or, I mean, do you have private discussions with them about this sort of thing? No, I was sort of detached from them. And I don't really, other than maybe bumping into one or two at conferences, I don't really have any direct communication with them. Uh, I do talk to people that do, so I do get some degree of update. But I, I don't really see a need to uh, to go in that direction at this stage. But I'm really not comfortable with with what some of them are saying. So I really have to watch. Go ahead. Uh, I was just, I, I have more shallow surface questions. Uh, what, yeah. what about the men who stare at goats, either the book or the movie? Did, did either of these capture the reality of what went on at that time? No. <laughs> but it was an entertaining movie. Uh, I saw it. In fact, I was invited to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, to be part of the, uh, the premiere opening in Baltimore. And um, the, I was invited down there by the movie critic for the Baltimore Sun. And uh, oh, we had a great time. Uh, the movie itself uh, really distorted um, what little reality there was in it on remote viewing. They had a few good points. Uh, it blended in the martial arts, which we were not really involved in in Stargate. So it took a uh, activity from another program, from the uh, another army program, um, written by James. And Shannon on a book called The New Earth Battalion uh, back in the 1980s when he was trying to promote the integration in the army of using some of the yoga techniques in meditation and martial arts to, to improve the ability of the uh, troops. Which is, and I think an admirable thing to do. I think it can be done and should be done. If, in fact, some of it probably is. But then the movie blended that in with remote viewing and amped up and I think the book that came out that backed up the movie uh, amped up the uh, the whole story to the point where it became almost like a spoof. In fact, it was a spoof, in my view, yeah. and totally distorted whatever uh, credibility there was in either the martial arts aspect or the remote viewing aspect. So uh, I enjoyed the movie, and I got a lot of publicity out of it, and led to a bunch of workshops for me. But uh, other than that, uh, it's people that I've talked to seem to understand where it was coming from and w what it was doing and sort of just said, okay, that's an interesting movie. Now tell me what really is going on, what really happened, <laughs> what is remote viewing? So in a way, it opened up queries from areas that I would never would have expected would be querying uh, on a topic. And recently I gave a presentation to a dowsing group, a professional dowsers that were very interested in the topic and uh, the movie uh, tip them off to the remote viewing connection, which they feel is somehow related to dowsing. I've also talked to other groups that normally would not have contacted me or anybody else. Uh, so there's been a lot of publicity uh, in what that movie did. So I'm not going to complain about that. And uh, I'm very confident that people then go to the movie, understand it's a spoof, Yet they'll walk away with questions. So in a in that sense, it, was it, it may have been a good thing. So I'm I'm not going to criticize it there. It, it was it's like the book that Dan Brown just wrote, um, the Lost Symbol. Uh, have you seen that or know about that? Is that the following to? I know about it. Yeah, there's a following the, the book that he wrote that follows the uh, Da Vinci Code. Yeah, and that is a very interesting book. True, it's fiction, and it creates a very weird story based in Washington, D.C., but it intermingled throughout the book is the really latest findings in psi research, in remote viewing, in, in quantum physics, the stuff we've been talking about so far with the random event generators. All that stuff is in there, and it's presented from a very positive point of view, intermixed with all the other crazy things that are going on in the story. And the the, the uh, heroes of the book, uh, so to speak, are connected with Ed Mitchell's organization. Remember the astronaut from Apollo 14? 
that set up the Institute for Noetic Sciences, IONS. Yep. Right. Uh, that's actually IONS is a very active research organization that looks into the uh, the issue of healing, the connection with mind body healing. Uh, Dean Radin, you've not heard, I'm sure you've heard of him. They had him on a couple uh, of times. Oh, okay. Though. Yeah, well, he's uh, the research uh, director there or uh, the key figure there. So he and Marilyn Schlitz and others at IONS are at the foreground, the foreground of everything we've been talking about here in the, the linking of healing and physics and higher co- and consciousness expansion. And that's in Dan Brown's book. And that book is really well read. And, of course, most people buy it for the entertainment aspect. Uh, Dan Brown's a good writer. He creates a really nice story. It's really exciting to follow that. Um, I led a book discussion group here in here in Hamburg on that just a few weeks ago, and it really uh, got a lot of attention from the people that, that got into the book. And it, But it's another one of those, it's, it's, it's a step above the uh, the Goats movie, but it's it's still there as fiction, but yet not fiction, because the part having to do with Psy and higher consciousness is well presented, and... Uh, you know, pick up and go from there, and then it creates it creates questioning in people, and as a result of that, uh, they learn more and find out that there really is uh, activity like uh, reg research, you know, random event generated research, healing research that's going on in the, in some parts of the holistic uh, health movement. So books like that and others too that are coming out. I'm sure there'll be more. I'm hoping that my next book, which I'm struggling with, uh, called Shadows of the Future, will add, will add to all this, too. But I'm coming in not from a fiction point of view, but from a reality point of view, and talking about premonitions and precognitive dreams and how that can be a benefit to, to anyone, not just uh, people that have them occasionally, but then, that everyone can tap into this particular uh, talent that's latent, just like Kundalini, and uh, be alerted to situations coming your way in the near future. When will that um, one be coming out? Um, hopefully within a year. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm putting finishing touches on the final third of it. So uh, it's going to be, I, I'd say, within a year. I'm not quite sure how I want to publish. Uh, to go with a publisher uh, or do a, uh, what do you call it, print on demand. Right. I have to wrestle with that one. So we'll see how that goes. I have one uh, more gotta... uh, remote viewing question. Yeah. Where do you think remote viewing is uh, overrated and where do you think it's underrated? I think it's overrated in the fact that people just can't sit down and do the style of remote viewing that's now being taught overnight or within a week or a month. Um, it takes time to, to go through the, what I call the complex methodology that's been developed and is now currently being presented by remote viewing trainers out there. Um, the, the, the other overrated part is that it, it strikes me as being somewhat limited and not everybody really needs to do remote viewing. Now, for example, I had a I had a um, federal marshal attend one of my workshops, and his main interest was intuition development. He didn't want to sit down and draw pictures or sketch or or take the time to uh, figure out what's in a remote scene or a sealed envelope. He didn't have time to do that on a job. He wanted to know whether there's somebody behind the door uh, had a lethal weapon or not. You know, so it was that intuitive, near-term, uh, gut reaction thing he needed to work on. So in, in that sense, I don't think remote viewing really is helpful. Um, also, remote viewing, the way it's taught, only sticks with a specific way of experiencing it. They don't even look at the integrated aspects like I do, for example, dreaming is a very good way to have intuitive uh, abilities, uh, experiences too. So I, I think it's limited in its scope. And the where it's good is it at least opens up the door and it allows people to explore an aspect of their psi talents, uh, but it should not end there. The individual that does study remote viewing should see this as a beginning process, and there's a lot more out there. Uh, there's a lot more to say uh, than what remote viewing trainers say. And I mean, I'm talking about the total personality and everything 
that we do day to day and that's useful to us. So it's it's a mixed bag. Uh, there's good things and there's questionable things. Um, the other issue I would take with it, I feel it's too complex the way it's presented. There are simpler ways to do remote viewing as we as we did in the early days of the research program, uh, which was really just fundamentally set the objective, relax, and uh, practice. Uh, that's as simple as you can get. But it takes time, and that's the key thing. And if it, if it teaches people to be patient, that's a huge benefit. Um, and sometimes I think the the uh, this the ethical part is not emphasized enough in people that do remote viewing training, uh, but that might be uh, just my own background showing where I, I do have a strong ethics, and maybe that's that's from some of the, my studies of the yoga background and martial arts. Even though I've never practiced martial arts, I've certainly read on it, and I have a lot of friends that are martial arts experts, uh, and I understand how they work in the arena they're in. So I can't answer it in a nice black and white answer, uh, but I hope what I've said is helpful for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I just, um, the thing I always go back to is, um, and I had talked to Dean Rain about this, was Joe McMonigle's book where the sort of the second half of the book was all predictions for the future, uh, and yeah. was, you know, economic and, and yeah. environmental and all of this. And I thought, man, that is such a bold thing to do because if you're wrong, it's a credibility killer. And yet, yeah. none of that stuff came true. So yeah. why did he put it in there, and what does that do to Joe McMonagall? I mean, it, okay, it, I, you know, I, that's, that's a really good question, and you're, you're the first one that's really brought it up to me. But I, I've also I've also noticed that, and it illustrates one of the problems of precognition. And the way I look at precognition, it is a sea of probabilities out there. Uh, in the near term, if you're looking at like a week ahead. I'd say it's highly reliable. But once you start going into the, the, the near future or even the far, especially the far future, you're really off the track. You, know, you don't know what the probability is going to shift. You, it may have been a very reasonable thing to say at the time of the prediction, but there were so many other variables coming into the picture that I don't think the best psychic in the world is going to comprehend. Uh, so it's best not to come in with a firm, long-term prediction like that. If you qualify it and say, here's a prediction 10 years from now that could could happen, uh, and then give it a probability number, you know, 50%. Become a weather forecaster. <laughs> not, not because you want to dodge it, but because that's, that's a realistic way of um, looking at it. So Joe might have erred in making it sound like, hey, here it is. Um, and that that I would find find fault with. I, I would never make a prediction that firm. In fact, I have actually published a paper on near-term predictions using precognitive dreaming that was published in a scientific journal, actually. And but there, I limited it to only one week in advance. And there, the results were fairly accurate. But I'll never say 100 percent even then. Um, so precognition is tricky. Uh, particularly when you're looking it into the long term. Uh, but that, and it also may be something about timing that comes in. The essence or the idea behind it, the concept may be on track, but then the timing is off um, by some kind of decades or even longer. Uh, look at Edgar Casey, if you studied him, and the, the earthquakes you know, in California sliding off into the ocean by 1990, because that didn't happen, because then you're talking geological time. And if you look at tectonic plates, yeah, um, um, half a million years from now, that's been, we're going to see a totally different shape of the, of the continent. So when you get into those kinds of predictions, I, I would say treat them as a, not like entertainment, but close to entertainment, and you'd be better off. Well, a, yeah, if, it, it, that's a, uh, the weather person analogy I think yeah. is great because yeah. – I just sort of saw it as, well, gee, you know, this is no better than guessing, so why do I need yeah. to learn remote viewing for that? But I guess what you're, you're saying is that it's, it's actually closer to, I mean, weathermen aren't just guessing. They, they do have 
percentages, yeah. they have a chance, right. and, and that's what sure. we're talking about here. So yeah, you're, I think you're right. I wish, I, I hope in the future, I hope someone takes your advice and does percentages. Well, I, at least you can say it's it's, it's a fifty fifty or it's seventy forty or whatever. Now, you can never really come up with those numbers, but at least you have a gut feel that you can come up with. And uh, I hope to address that in my next book, Shadows of the Future. Uh, and, and and also, I I agree with you that. Uh, it, maybe Joe did uh, lose a little credibility on that. I'll have to go back and look at some of those predictions. But like I said, his fault, the fault I see was he came on too firm. Uh, you know, And, and uh, that's true anywhere if you, when you start making predictions. Uh, if you go forward in time and the further in time you're trying to make a prediction and because of the, the probabilities, you lose accuracy as you go forward in time, can you RV backwards? In time. Well, this this whole thing about time is what what you're asking here is, what is time? You know, <laughs> is is time an internal now, uh, or is time something that's malleable, like like an alternative future, only only an alternative time? Um, there's several ways of looking at it. I sometimes wonder if these concepts of going back in time. We shouldn't look we should look at it more like going into a library and pulling out a history book. In a sense, you've gone back in time by reading that history. But it's recorded now. Here it's available here and now. So it's it's like a hologram recording information. Uh, it's it's done. It's a done deed. Uh, you can access the information in this holographic universe that I think is part of this consciousness field. But it's it's done. You're not going to change the past. So going back in time is is no. It's like picking up a history book. Not going back into an alternative uh, past or a past and, and changing it there. Similarly, what is the future? And I'm not sure if, if it's not something like I just said. Only going forward, that all the information that's possibly available, however this happens through quantum phenomenon or whatever, uh, is recorded in some cosmic hologram. So this, this consciousness field could be a, a part of a, a hologram. And that this holographic information is there, including trends and intentions. And it's that information that makes it look like it's a future. Uh, if you, for example, people had had a premonition of 9-11 was that a future they've had a prediction of? And there's some really good, good material out there in this. It's very accurate. Was was that a prediction of a future coming our way, or was that an access of an intention that existed now, that in the minds of the terrorists that were picked, that was picked up by a lot of people? Uh, so how do you want to look at it? Um, right now, I'm thinking in terms of time as being like an internal now. And that, that the future is a projection of all the information that exists now. You, you may want to speculate that, oh, yeah, this could be represented as an alternative universe or a multiverse, like some theoretical physicists are talking about. Branching universes is another term. Dean Radin might have mentioned that uh, in, in their talk. But I'm not sure that's the way to look at it. So I'm still wrestling with this. And I don't know if I'll be any closer to having a better answer to you um, when time I get my book out or not. Um, but th these are things I think about, and I don't know how far I'll get with them. <laughs> you you have some awesome stories in your books about successes um, from yeah. the art, the remote viewers and yeah. some of the things they accomplished. Yeah. Um, my question about going back in time was, did anybody ever officially try to remote view the past to get an accurate description of events that were being reported and the the truth was being questioned. Let, let's just say you just wanted to know who shot JFK. Would, could you sit somebody down, RV, and see what happened? Uh, okay. Have you ever uh, done anything? Uh, like that? First of all, to answer your question, no, there was nothing officially done on the remote viewing program to go into the past. That doesn't mean some of my former colleagues in a spare time didn't attempt something like that. You, you can't um, like look over people's shoulders all the time. So, but to answer no, we didn't do that officially. I read, I read some of the stuff English Swan's been putting out, uh, has put out. Yeah, I, I don't have much credibility. That, that's, that's pretty another, fantastic. That's, a, that's another story. I don't want to go there. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Another story. 
Um, okay. if, so, what was the second part of your question? I wanted to address that. I uh, asked about going back and backwards yeah. in time, and if you had probabilities of the further going back. Well, if see, because of the way I look at time, it's not an issue because time, everything that's happened in the past, that's it. There's right. not a probability. Here. Right. Uh, but it's like accessing information about time, that uh, about any event in time, wherever that is, you know, where, wherever that occurred, that information still exists somewhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can go in, a, in figuratively speaking, go back in time, just like when you go into a library. Right. You go back in time and you open up that book. Uh, so in the records, this, this holographic kind of concept I had. Uh, yeah, you can, you can. There must be a, uh, an icon. <laughs> Here we go into computer terminology. An icon that says, "Okay, go go back five years." You know, okay, and you go to the files in this cosmic consciousness and and find it there. So it's not destroyed. The information continues on, uh, recorded. You go back and find it. So you're not really going back in time. You're going back to a place in the in the files where the information is recorded. It's kind of the way I look at it. Right or not, I don't know. I'm just giving you. I, I understand what you're saying, and there's there's more people out there that have similar theories and saying. Um, two more questions for you. Yeah. As people were going through the remote viewing learning process, you yeah. said it was complex and lengthy. The, the latter part was yes. Did people have other paranormal fringe psi experiences as they increased their ability to remote view? I think so. I think one of the people talked about remembering dreams more, uh, although at that time. We were strictly a remote viewing house, and we didn't really talk about things like that. Although we did modify the protocol to include what was called extended remote viewing, and that was kind of a sleep-like state, at least a highly relaxed state. Um, and people, dreaming. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, uh, now, if people had increased their paranormal experiences outside of the, uh, the workshop, we didn't really talk a lot about that. Uh, there were there were times when hunches we talked about, um, but you know we didn't really explore that. We we just kind of stayed on on the, on the nine to five job. You know, and, uh, not even barroom talk, uh, lunchroom. And, and even there, um, things like that didn't come up a lot. There was one exception. We did have a woman on the program that was an identical twin. And ever, and she she and her twin had incredible experiences um, on the side, you know, in, mm -hmm. in their private lives. We were, and this happened all the way from childhood on. It was not a result of her being in the remote viewing program, although that might have enhanced her side of it. Uh, we talked about some of those uh, coincidences and experiences that, that she and the twin had. Um, I know as a manager, I, I, I couldn't really take part in the remote viewing projects. That was a no-no for management. But even in, in my capacity uh, as a manager, I had a lot of experiences that related to the people on the program. Uh, and that jumped up uh, in, you know, in terms of the people getting sick, and I would know about it before I got to the office, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I didn't tell anybody that, right. except in one instance. Uh, when I had to have people get ready for the emergency vehicle, which I knew we had a call because I had a dream the night before a particular person in the remote viewing group uh, falling over on the floor and rolling around. That was in the dream, and I took that seriously, and I had the telephone numbers ready to go in case that did happen the next day. And sure enough, uh, there he was at 9 o'clock, fell over, I rolled around on the floor, I very calmly uh, dialed 911 and got the EMT people over there. It, it was a uh, kidney stone attack. Uh, but it was the kind of thing that happened to me, you know. And uh, So I had developed a sensitivity uh, that happened um, off duty, so to speak, right. uh, having to do with being in tune with the people more. And I'm sure they had their own increases in intuition, particularly those people that were not really paying attention to the intuition before they got into the program that, that were so-called trained after mm -hmm. they got there. Now, now, people like Joe was up and running. He didn't really need any uh, particular training because he was hot off the press, so to speak. And so were a few of the other uh, people that came into the remote viewing program early on. They, they uh, already were very capable, uh, talented. Well, they may not have called it remote viewing, but uh, they already had these side uh, things happen to them. They had natural ability. Yeah, and there are a lot of people 
in the military that have these things, these intuitive, this high, high intuition. Uh, they just don't talk about it. And in fact, I think some of the high level generals are extremely intuitive. Uh, and they would have been very good remote viewers too. <laughs> you, we were talking about trauma opening you up, yeah. and um, one of the remote viewers—I don't remember his name. What's in, didn't he become psychic after being shot in the head in Vietnam or something? Well, that's that's his story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's the end of my comment. <laughs> All right. Move on. And we're we're running <laughs> we're running long here, and I don't care how long we go. Um, but one thing we were talking about before we went on with Jeremy, um, I mentioned that I see a, a paradigm shift from. Um, flying saucers, which are hubcaps and nuts and bolts, things from other star systems, mm -hmm. to it being more interdimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's even a lot of mm -hmm. publicity in mainstream media that's saying, you know, uh, physics can pr provide prove that there's 11 dimensions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you think it's more a global consciousness. Can you elaborate yeah, was, on that? Okay, I, that's a kind of a term I'm using right now because that fits in with the Princeton concepts uh, and the random event generator. And, of course, they're only looking at the global from an Earth global point of view. Right. Um, on the other hand, if this works, and, quantum, and I believe it does, the quantum physics has this unlimited reach, then there's no reason why it's got to be limited to this solar system uh, or this this dimension, if you want to use that, that term dimension. I like to think in terms of region or strata. Um, so... I think that yeah, it's it's it can reach into these other dimensions as you say, just as easily as it can within our own uh, perceivable dimension. I don't see any problem with that. Uh, if if it works like we think it does here in, within this universe, uh, why limit it? <laughs> and where is the alternative dimension? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the universe is a kind of a big place, and there, there are many, many possibilities. Quantum physics says that you can link it with anything, no matter where right. it is. It's a matter of the frequency, of the intentionality, the tuning, all those good things. And they're um, saying we can only see a small portion yeah, of it. Yeah. So whether or not the UFO phenomenon is only is interdimensional, or even from intelligences from other solar systems in our dimension like that's that's still fantastic and uh, quantum physics concepts non-locality entanglement uh, would certainly permit that to happen from an information point of view uh, now uh, if we're talking about the actual appearance of say an object a craft from <clears throat> some dimension into this dimension i don't know about that i still think we're looking at information uh but i don't know about the material part we think of wormholes well, mathematically, um, they, they can be shown to be a, a valid mathematical construct for linking between one dimension and another. Uh, I, I think Kip Thorne at uh, Caltech has shown theoretically, and it's convinced most everyone I know of that's studied the theory, that this can only work uh, in the future. It can't go uh, backward. But, but, again, that kind of tracks something I had said earlier about time. Um, but the energies and the effort amount to actually to actually use wormholes in a physical engineering sense would be, you know, almost astronomical. And I know these are the concepts we'll be talking about next week at the conference in Boulder. But um, I don't see that as wormholes as being very practical, other than from an interesting mathematical construct. Um, it, it gives us a concept. But the mechanism behind where in homes, I don't think is the way to go. There has to be some other connecting concept that would uh, permit this. Uh, and, and, and in fact, um, once you get into quantum physics, you're not even in space-time curvature anymore. Uh, and wormholes operate on space-time curvature. Uh, so quantum physics and gravity are still not reconciled theoretically. Uh, so we're talking about an independent kind of system, even though some theorists are trying to link uh, quantum gravity with quantum physics and so on, and it may ultimately happen. Uh, and, and maybe that experiment <clears throat> that's being set up right now over in Europe in the uh, huge underground uh, CERN, yeah, CERN that, that might shed some clues onto the basic structure of matter down to what's called the gravitational aspect. 
uh, boson or whatever, the Higgs particle. Uh, things might come out of that. It gives a, a, an understanding of uh, another level of um, space-time and, and mass and gravity. This really is a lot yet we don't know, <laughs> as you can probably I'm, I'm glad to actually hear you say that. Because <laughs> there's I think a lot we don't know. I, it's I frustrating. It's pretty naive to think that we do have a grip on, on what. But we do, we do know what can work. We know for our own personal intuitive abilities and healing abilities. You know, that's pretty fantastic uh, in itself. And, uh, you know, we should be happy to have learned that. And we don't need to learn that from contemporary science, although it's contemporary science from the physics side is sort of helping um, comprehend it. Uh, we can embrace our, our friends in the indigenous community and say, yeah, let's work together and, and, and prove, prove our abilities through their methodologies and concepts and, and stuff that we're doing now in the advanced physics side. It's all kind of the same language or, or the same direction, different language maybe. Yeah. This is fascinating. This is, um, as I'm sitting here and listening to this, I'm realizing this whole conversation is sort of encapsulated everything we've done on the show with the exception of the trickster <laughs> like pretty much <laughs> the umbrella of issues is in this episode so i think this is going to end up being our first uh, episode of the next uh, next uh, okay. go around it's wonderful yeah. yeah so you know thank you very much with uh, i i actually just got the the book hansen's book the trickster and i only read a few pages and the first thing that popped into my head is um you know you have an interdimensional window and something comes through some of the, the, the tricksters in my mind are like rats on a, on a ship. You know, we have a ship come into port and unloads food and cars and medical supplies, but we get the rats too. You know, I, I think there's good things that come through. And I think the things that are creating havoc in people's lives and people seeing and, and scaring people, I think they're the rats. Now, after looking at this book, I like to see you study this. Years ago, I did study uh, the Native American um, mythology and the concepts behind it, the tricksters. So I'd like to see what, what this says. I'll let you borrow it. I, didn't, yeah, okay. I just started it. I read <clears throat> yeah, like thanks. three books at a time. So. <clears throat> thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else, Jody? Nope, I'm good. Okay. I had, I had questions and questions and questions on remote viewing and Stargate. And we totally didn't go that way, and, and I think it was better. Well, yeah, I feel like this was the most fascinating interview with a remote viewer that I've ever heard. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, okay. Dale, and um, thank you for coming on and doing this. Okay. And, um, and Jody, you were fantastic. So uh, thank you, sir, for, for doing this. Yeah. It was my first time. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And, yeah. And, and thanks for letting me uh, ask a few questions. Um, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Very nice of you. Yeah. And so thanks again. Uh, is there a website or anything that you have that you want us to uh, mention? Yeah, right. I do have a website. That's, of course, www.dalegraff.com. D-A-L-E-G-R-A-F-F.com. Great. Thank you very much, okay. Dale Graff. Okay. You've been listening to Paratopia. Okay. Yeah, weird. And the hosts are Jeffrey Richman and Jeremy Vaney. No big whoop. Mini me. Stop humping the laser. Oh. If you record audio for any purpose, chances are you want it to be heard. You want to attract the largest audience possible who can hear your message. That's where we come in. We're CyberEars.com, a revolutionary Internet service that will host your audio files and help you promote and track its popularity. Considering hosting a podcast to the world, we have all the automated tools to make the process as simple and easy as it can be. No technical mumbo-jumbo to work out. CyberEars.com does all the work for you. You record it, we take care of the rest. So don't delay. Go to CyberEars.com today and register for a free trial account. Upload your audio files and get heard. With CyberEars.com, it's your audio on your terms. Jody Heckman. Hello, sir. How are you today? <laughs> was that a clown horn? What was that? I'm going to I'm going to text message from a lady I work with. Her son's going to the hospital. Ah, sorry to hear that. That's all right. Um so 
How how do you feel about uh, having done your first episode? Um, went. I thought it went well. I wasn't sure how I wanted to incorporate what I knew of his experience of the remote viewing and the Stargate program. I wanted to tie him into everything you guys have been doing and the whole parallel dimensions and uh, increase in paranormal activity, consciousness, a little bit on the uh, indigenous people. And uh, I didn't have to. He went that direction. So I thought that was kind of what an amazing synchronicity. Yeah, it was an amazing. Sy- well, and, and I thought that you were great. And I, um, as I told you, I, you know, I, I feel like we did tie together a lot of the threads that we've covered in the last 70 episodes. And, uh, you know, I'm always a big fan of taking someone seemingly out of their element, although he went in the direction he wanted to, so it was his element. But I think talking to, you know, one of the heads of the Stargate remote viewing program and sort of the last thing we talked about was remote viewing. I think, to me, that's fascinating, and uh, I think you did a a great job with it. Well, thank you. I I think it's kind of uh, interesting to look back and look at, all the programs, the podcasts that you guys have done. And it seems like the next one takes a little bit from a couple previous ones and adds to it in a way that ties everything together even more. Right. And I, I, I think he did that too. Yeah. Yeah. Although um, I think it would be great if you'd be up for it at some point in the future to have him back on and do the pure Stargate remote viewing episode. Yeah. Um, or try. <laughs> He, he seemed very happy to do it and uh, willing. Uh, I know he's very busy, and he's actually going to North Carolina for the next couple of weeks. So I told him if people had questions or I could uh, facilitate connecting him to the forum, um, he said, well, just give me a couple of weeks because I'm really busy. But I, I think overall it was fascinating how he started off with intuitive experiences and precognition, ended up going and pursuing aeronautical engineering and being involved in the space program and getting involved with the DIA and the CAA and doing becoming a physicist and then going back into remote viewing. And now he's, uh, I don't know how old he is. I'm going to say 60, seventies and he's back into the intuitive side again. So he's got a real nice wide realm to draw from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I thought that, um, that you had mentioned that you were nervous, uh, in the beginning and it didn't come across that you were nervous at all. Well, I, I, I wrote down what I wanted to say in the beginning as an introduction, and I felt like I just read it. And then sometimes when I'm nervous, I read real fast and mm-hmm. stutter and mutter and mumble. And But uh, once once that came out and was over with, I just kind of tried to pay attention to him. And uh, once that nervousness and anxiety dissipated, then I could think about what he was saying and, and what I wanted um, to ask him, what questions came to me from what he was saying. And I also wanted to kind of steer him into... Uh, what I thought would be appropriate for the podcast in a form and, and take him in that direction, which I said he, he did all on his own. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you personally? Did you learn anything or are there, did it raise more questions for you? Like I felt like we could have talked to him all night. Yeah. Um, I actually, I wrote down a bunch of things that, that came to mind right after. Uh, and I was afraid I would forget it if I waited too long to go over things. Um, one of the things I found interesting and I'd like to, to dive into a little deeper with him was, uh, he's commented on some of the successes they had and his, his books, I read both of his books, uh, a couple of years ago and I gave them away. Like I do most of my good reading. I want to spread the word and let other people learn. And, uh, so I couldn't review them, but to the best of my recollection, they were more accounts of what they did and the successes that they had. And then, um, after we were done with the show and before he left, I said, I know you had a lot of successes. Why did the program fold up? He said he had a couple of uh, jerks that were in charge and they were going for reviews of their budget and how much money they'd have and, and sit in front of a board from Congress and, and tell them how things were going and, and whether to continue the program. And the people in charge didn't want anything to do with it. They were diehard, hardcore military. We need to get out there with guns and spies and we don't have room for this crazy psychic mystic stuff. And Dale said they were successful, but the problem was they were under the army but most of their success was with the Coast Guard. He said they had a very high success rate with them, assisting them with um, drug interdiction. He said they, they were kind of predicting who was coming across where and when, and the Coast Guard would go there and catch them and meet them. So the Army's perspective, it wasn't successful, but they were doing great work for the Coast Guard, which, which is cool. But uh, I 
it'd be nice to be a fly on the wall somewhere to see if they still are doing stuff like this, but it's just not public knowledge anymore. Because if they were getting success with it, I can't believe somebody somewhere isn't continuing this and just let the drop. Yeah, I thought that they were, I thought they had to stop the program because Congress was sniffing around uh, military budgets. I think it was because of Iron Contra, maybe, or something else that had gone on around that time. Yeah, but, you know, if they want to do something, they just change the name, tuck it under somebody else's budget, and, and keep going. Right. It's just the shell game. One thing I thought was cool was, um, well, not cool, but made a question for me was, um, I've followed Ingo Swan a little bit, and I know he was one of the early forerunners in the RV program. He was considered, I, I believe, uh, Nori called him the most successful psychic that they've ever had. Um, he's very he's very artistic too, and he wrote an online book called Penetrations, which if you've ever seen that is is quite crazy. It talks about him um, RV in the backside of the moon, uh, some of the stuff he saw uh, going out and doing stuff in the universe, um, being taken aside by Men in Black, and I mean it, it's it's sounds like a great Twilight story episode. Yeah, yeah, and yet he didn't want to talk about Ingo Swan at all, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and Mike, I was going to ask Dale, how do you validate what's crazy or what's legitimate? You know, I, if if Ingo was quite successful as an RVer and did a lot of good stuff for him, but then Ingo goes and starts branching off and starts talking about UFOs and aliens on the backside of the moon, what makes that not successful or true or real, whereas the other RV stuff that he did was true and real? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, part of it is that you know, Dale is presenting papers to the scientific community at large, right? And so he's got to be careful what he says he believes probably is part of it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I see that. But even sitting here aside of him as we were doing this, there was uh, a nonverbal change in his behavior. I, I picked up that that was uncomfortable for him to talk about. I'm not going to push the issue, but I'd like to know why. I'd like to know if it's because of personal beliefs or because of experience that he's just going to remain tight-lipped over. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the the last thing I knew, I knew, I know people who know Ingo Swan. I've never met Ingo Swan, but I had asked them, you know, is there any way to get him on our show? And they said he just he doesn't do anything anymore, and that he basically is very cynical and sitting in his apartment waiting for the end of the world. Like that's that's sort of where he sees this going. So that to me implies that he at least believes what he says he believes. Right is going on, um, but I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that that uh, Dale um, recommended Courtney Brown's new book, and yet his first two books are quite fantastic. Yeah, I mean, arguably, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> made out of whole cloth. So, any final thoughts on Dale Graff or your time well spent here? One thing I noticed too was when we were talking about um, global consciousness, and he was starting to research poltergeist activity, and he. I tried to get him to talk a little bit more about it near the end, about how he felt that it was more of a result of our global consciousness uh, and the energy that we're putting out there. But he said it wasn't just the consciousness from the Earth. It was from the solar system, the universe, and the whole cosmos, which to me is implying that he believes that there's more consciousness out there. But as soon as we start talking about UFOs and, and uh, ET craft being nuts and bolts, he didn't want to comment too much on that stuff. I know he had been at Wright Patterson. Uh, I don't know when he was there, but he said nobody ever mentioned anything about alien spaceships or nothing like that. It was all experimental aircraft and that kind of stuff. Well, do you think he knows more than he's uh, letting on about this stuff, or do you think that um, it's just sort of a taboo subject for him? Uh, it could be both. He could know more than he's letting on, um, and maybe he has personal beliefs that he's not letting on because he doesn't want to get labeled as such. Being uh, a facilitator for group events and RV experiences and um, doing these dreams uh, interpretations and being part of a international dream organization and trying to interpret what's going on there and make heads or tails, maybe he doesn't want to get tied into the UFO world too much because for the same reason you guys are. There's too many nut jobs out there and and uh, he doesn't want to get involved with that. Yeah. That, I mean, that, I gotta think privately people, I mean, as soon as you've, you've developed a gift like this, it seems like the natural way to go is to, you know, look everywhere you can with it. Uh, so it seems like it would be a natural outcome that he would have looked at maybe UFOs or, you know, Mars or something. Well, it may be natural for you and I, but maybe not natural for him. Maybe he's not interested in what's out there because there's so much to explore what's here. 
and you know you don't even have to go outside your body he's he's doing dream interpretation and and consciousness and all that stuff and he's you know exploring his consciousness and i mean that's a lifetime pastime right there uh passion you don't even have to go outside of your body so I, I can understand that perspective you know i don't know if i agree with that i'm uh i want to know all i can about everything ufos parallel dimensions ghosts consciousness kundalini and i think to get as much information as you can you know i don't i don't believe too much of what greer's doing but i do look at greer and listen to what he's saying uh if i'm going to make an informed decision for myself i want to look at both sides of the coin what, what's the other side <laughs> greer Greer, to me, Greer's the other side of the coin. He's he's out there. I mean, I, I I'm the only one. Billy or uh, is is it Billy Meyer? Yeah. To me, they're the other side of the coin. We're the only ones. Uh, you know, oh, I this, see what you're saying. I thought you meant that you yeah. actually take some of what he says to heart because I, I just see him as you know somebody who's latched on to a mindset that is uh, makes you money. You know, so yeah. It's, it's yeah. Like, you know, I know a, a lot of people who are like, oh, but how can you not like Greer? He talks about free energy, and everyone wants free energy, right? He's pro this and pro that and pro all of these things. It's like, well, but that's no different than a televangelist, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I I think we as individuals have to take responsibility and educate ourselves and not take what somebody else is saying to heart and saying it's true and this is it and that's that. I'm not going to look any further. Because when I started looking into the the fringe paranormal stuff more and more and more it something clicked inside of me like this makes a lot of sense uh you know it's not in the local newspaper and it's not on the news but i always felt like there was more out there than what they were telling me so as soon as i started coming across greer and and meyer and uh stuff like you guys and reading all these books that i do i'm like man this makes more sense to me on how reality is and and what's out there and there's more out there than they're they're teaching us teaching my kids in school I think so that you don't become a Greerite, you got to go out there and you got to listen to everybody, at least in the beginning, and formulate your own opinion about what's going on by educating yourself, not just listening to somebody else. Right. Well, on that note, let me ask you then, because, you know, Jeff uh, Ritzman's whole thing has been in regards to Horn and Billy Meyer, um, was I did battle with Michael Horn for a year because anyone new coming into this, um, I didn't want them to, uh, feel as though, you know, that they didn't have the other side of that story, you know, that, that they might fall for it if somebody's not there calling bullshit on it. And, um, and then he realized, well, wait a minute, if anyone's that stupid, then they're not going to be able to discern bullshit anyway. So what's the point? Do you feel that way? Do you think that you needed somebody to point out that like, the wedding cake photos are cups and string, or do you feel like you could just look at them on your own and be like, yeah, this is crap. Even though I kind of like some of what is being said here, it's coming from an inauthentic source. In the beginning, I think somebody saying that this is bullshit helps. Um, when I saw his pictures of the uh, aliens in their foil suits with their little uh, KB toy laser pistol right. i was like man what a coincidence this is from the 60s and it looks like it's from the 60s you know but when somebody that i would give more credibility to because of the amount of research and information they have like jeff says you know this is all fake i'm like oh good it ain't just me you know that's what i thought somebody else is reinforcing that so so right on that just validates that my intuition and, and my findings i'm heading in the right direction but um you have to be careful too i think being too polarized on one side of the fence or the other doesn't allow people to make their own mistakes and learn from them. Because I think no matter what I'm told, I probably will not listen to it or give that information near as much weight as if I have the experience myself and learn from it. Right. You know, I, I think if you understand what I'm saying, yeah. most people don't change. Most people don't believe until they have the experience themselves. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to fall down and skin your knee a few times to, uh, that's, that's the best teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of doing this podcast, does it give you the bug to want to do more, to talk more, to be more public or, um, or what? I'm a, uh, type B personality. I'm a paramedic. So I just kind of sit back and go with the flow until the need arises and then I'll step up to the plate. Um, I've got some 
health things going on. Uh, they're testing me for Lyme's and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and all this stuff. Jeez, I'm sorry. But no, that's okay. It's life gives you lemons, make lemonade. You know, and I ran into Dale at the gas station the other day. Um, he used to frequent the uh, coffee shop from the building that I used to own. That's how I got to know him. And uh, it's not a coincidence or synchronicity. You know, I was introduced to him and our paths crossed, made an uh, acquaintance connection with him, ran into him the other day right after you guys were saying, we want listeners to make podcasts. And I'm like, oh, awesome. What an opportunity. So, hey, Dale, you want to sit down and talk with these guys? Yep, yep, yep. Sounds great. You know, now if, if I've got some health issues that prevent me from being a paramedic out in the street, helping people in that way, and I've got to slow down and take care of myself better, well, then I'll put my butt in a chair and I'll sit down and talk to people and I'll help people this way. So whatever happens, happens, and whatever, you know, life deals me, I'll respond to and do continue my, my mission here on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jody, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Good luck with your mission on Earth. <laughs> and um, and thanks for setting the bar really, really high for every every uh, listener podcast to follow. If anybody wants to uh, do this, I have never done this before. I was scared shitless to do it, and. Uh, it was really easy. Um, Jeremy, you recorded it. You helped me. We've been playing phone tag and trying to set things up. And I got Dale on and asked him a few questions, and, and he did the rest of it. you know. And I modeled what I was doing after what you and Jeff do because I have no other experience or references to go by. And it was easy. It was fun. And you know, maybe I can dig up some other people to do some more. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely be looking forward to it. So I can't wait to hear this and listen to it and tell all my friends that's me that's me and most of them aren't going to listen to it anyway because they think i'm a you know a retarded woo woo oh you believe in ufos do you you know <laughs> <laughs> well maybe this will change their mind because they'll hear how serious it is and how just sort of thought-provoking it can be as opposed to woo woo yeah but uh, the people that i'm close to tolerate it there's a few that are into it and uh people ask you what you're doing and I try and keep it very light, and if their eyes glaze over, I stop. You know, when, when somebody comes up to me and, and starts talking about this kind of stuff, you got to test the waters before you start overloading them with information. Some people will bite and ask more questions, and then I'll, I'll feed them, and I'll keep giving them more information. But some people you say something to, and it's like a switch gets flicked in the back of their brain, and their eyes glaze over, and they don't want to hear anymore, and, you know, you're challenging their reality, and they don't want that, so... Whether it's true or not, I just shut up and leave them keep living their dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, you've run into that. You've, yeah, I mean, but there's, you know, I'm also sympathetic to it in, in that we all know the type of person who can't shut up about it. That's all they talk about. It's socially awkward, you know, uh, whether it's this or any, you know, just anything. Uh, and I think this is one of those subjects that if you if you initiate the conversation, it's like, uh oh, if this guy's willing to wear crazy like this on his sleeve then maybe I shouldn't uh, talk to him because he's, he's probably one of those one of those chatty Cathy's who, who only talks about the one thing, you know, if that just made sense. I mean, that, that that's what I seem to run into. It's like people who are just so one note that they only want to talk about this stuff. And it's like, dude, don't you understand how people perceive you? And then you ruin it for the rest of us who just want to, like, live normal lives and slowly but surely eke it into the conversation, you know? Yeah, 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 I understand what you're saying. All right, my friend. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. You, you. I couldn't have done this without you. And I don't think what I did was anything other than just ask a few questions and pursue my interests as well. It's like Jeff said. You know, this is kind of selfish. I, I'm not doing this to, to to do this more or get attention or anything. I'm. Uh, I saw an opening and uh, I picked up the ball and ran with it just to fill the hole. You know, I. I have no dreams of grandeur of becoming a famous podcaster. <laughs> You're listening to my good friends Jeremy Vaney and Jeff Rickman laugh their way through Paratopia. So the Jeff. So the Jer. You don't know how much I miss doing that. I'm I'm sure everyone out there in podcast land missed it as well. <laughs> We're down one Gary Coleman, so there's no more What You Talking About, Willis. All right, yeah. So we could be the next What You Talking About, Willis. Not a shame. Jody Heckman, eh?
Dale Graff, eh? Yes. See? Quite interesting. Yeah. That was everything that, that we said it would yeah. be and more. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Yeah. If I, if I may be inside the head of the listener for one moment and project into them <laughs> what they're thinking. <laughs> Meanwhile, that sucked. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it was. I think it was great. And um, and there you go, folks. That's that's the first one. And I, and I think that goes to show you it can be done. Yes, the bar has been set. It has been set high. Mm-hmm. But do not fear to jump it. Hope yes. Our friends, do not fear to jump it. <laughs> so what do you think of uh, Mr. Graf? What do you what's your what's your take? I was well, as I said in the interview, I th- I was I think this was the best remote viewer interview I've ever heard. And, and mainly that's because we barely touched on remote viewing. Right. Um, I, I think he has his finger in many pies and um, has a lot to offer, which is to say he's smart about a lot of things. And um, I feel like any sort of any one giant topic that we talked about, we could have gone off into a side tangent that would have been its own show. And uh, mm. I, I love shows like that where just information comes at you and at you and at you and it's right. kind of overwhelming. Um, and I really, I liked, I, I was surprised at how many things we agreed with. How about that? Just about life, the universe and everything. And in particular, when we did start talking about remote viewing, uh, you know, when you say to, you know, the head of Project Stargate, so so who do you like? Who would you trust? Whose book would you recommend? And he says, Nobody. I think that's very telling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, the one thing that caught my ear was um, he said that Courtney Brown had a good book. Yeah, Courtney Brown's latest book is purely a remote viewing book. It's not anything hmm. about aliens and stuff. But I don't know how you differentiate one from the other. I mean, do you just figure, well, he lied. <laughs> I, I don't know. I he mean, lied for a couple of books, but he's back now and he's in good health. I mean, what, what do you do? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I have to say, you know, I'm not a big remote viewing person, fan, whatever you want to call it. And um, I, I got to say, I was a little surprised to hear, I don't know, how relaxed he was about the notion that it's not so accurate as everyone paints it. Pretty much every remote viewer that I've ever heard speak has talked about, wow, this is so accurate. And, you know, if you work at it, this can be trained and this can be, and this can be this amazing ability that people have. And I have no doubt that there's something to it. I have no doubt that it can probably in some cases be an amazing ability. But I think that um, Dale really uh, didn't marginalize it, but, but sort of set it into a realistic framework of this is not as accurate as everybody thinks. This is not exactly how it works. I, I think a lot of myths uh, about this whole thing got kind of dispelled a little bit by talking to him, which was great to hear for me. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think what he does that the others who write these books don't do is he differentiates the pure remote viewing material and setup from his own personal what hobbies, likes, dislikes. I mean, mm-hmm. he's quick to say, look, I, I wrote these books. They're not the best books or the most definitive books on the topic because they include stuff about dreams and about, you know, that, that sort of thing, things that interest areas that interest him. Whereas, you know, the remote viewer next to him might write a book about remote viewing and, and dreams and not differentiate that it might present it as a pure book on remote viewing, that this is what it's all about. That includes all of that. Yeah. Right. What it's all about, you know, yeah, getting to the heart of this stuff, or you know, and I liked what he said about uh, about having setting it up like a weather forecaster type thing, where it's like, well, seventy percent accuracy. I mean, at that point, if you're predicting the future with percentages, uh, then what's the point of predicting the future? I mean, are you? What's the difference between you and a futurist who just looks at trends and predicts an outcome yeah. based on them? Uh, yeah. I don't know, but I, I kind of I'm attracted to the idea that the psychic ability has some value to it up to about a week. It's got like a week expiration date. Well, that's pretty much what he said, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I anything like that. that's futuristically forecast, it has about a week, you know, shelf life. And then it kind of goes off onto another thread. And, and that's kind of, I mean, hey, doesn't this go back to what Master Yoda told us? <laughs> Always in motion is the future. You know, so, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean yeah. isn't it a great way to look at it that, that, yeah, that psychic ability, psychic forecasting has a shelf life. And mm-hmm. again, there's another thing that you see these people dredging up Nostradamus and dredging up, uh, oh, yeah. you know, who, who's the other one? The American, uh, he had mentioned him, Edgar Casey. 
Right. You know, and you just keep going after these and chiseling away at these words these people put on a page and trying to create something out of them. It's like, no, that stuff expired. Time to let it go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's. You talk about the Nostradamus stuff. All of that is so incredibly interpretational as to what he actually is writing. I mean, to what they even actually mean. And so, I don't think that there's been a whole lot of predictions that have been beforehand. Everything seems to come after the fact, which is all too familiar with a lot of prediction uh, material out there. You don't get. I mean, that goes right down into the Billy Meyer stuff, <laughs> which. You know, it's always an after-the-fact issue. Um, well, isn't it funny so, that we're at the point now where we're making predictions about what predictions mean? Like, even including the Mayan calendar, it's like everyone in the Mayan calendar prediction thing of 2012 believes that they predicted something for the future. They can't agree on what. Right. <laughs> so they've got to predict now. They've got to psychically predict what the psychic prediction was all about. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like that's how convoluted... All this yeah. prophecy stuff is for me. I, I I think about you know the idea of predicting the future, and I just don't. I, I mean, based on the sheer. I mean, this this man is a physicist, correct? So, string theory and all of these things. I mean, all come to kind of play into that. And and so, how could you possibly follow just? I mean, you may be predicting the future in another timeline, or or you know, or or in another dimension, you might get it right, but. I mean, who couldn't do that at that point? There's so many tangible tangents, you know, within a within a tree forking out from one singular event. I don't know how you'd ever even limit that to a week. Um, right. but, but I mean, hey, if it works, it works. I found out the um, the 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 interesting part to me that I that I think um, made a lot of sense was the idea of of going backwards. In time and remote viewing past events like who shot JFK and Hitler in the bunker and all of this kind of stuff. And I thought that was interesting the way that he presented that in the sense of you're looking at um, uh, like a history book. That's kind of how you're, you, you have to do this. It's, it's not so much going back to that time period. You're just looking up and looking into energies that are residual of what happened. And so it's almost like looking it up in an encyclopedia. Again, it gets into what are you looking at? If you're looking at a residual energy, are you looking at the residual energy of what actually happened or the residual energy of what the the mo you know the consciousness of the time thought was happening? The, the most amount of people, if they had a theory, is that what you would see? <laughs> right, right. Which leaves the residual energy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Strongest I, imprint. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's very, it's all very interesting. I don't, um, like I said, I, I've not been a big remote viewing follower or fan, but... Um, I have no doubt that there's something to it, but um, I, I thought I, Jody did a great job. And oh, uh, he did once yeah. again. Uh, you know, he said he was really nervous. I didn't hear it. Really? Yeah. No, not at all. I didn't get that at all. I mean, I think he did a great job. Yeah, and congratulations to him as he is now, as of this broadcast, I believe, on his honeymoon. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. Hey. hey. <laughs> You're screwed. <laughs> um, anyway. And not just con- for the honeymoon. Congratulations to Mrs. Mulhog as well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Long may you roll in the muck. Yes. So next week we have uh, Dr. Rourke and Senor Roundtree. Yes. Um, they basically riff off of a question I had had on the, the forum about their work with wormholes. Right. And it spirals into two hours of awesomeness. That will rip your skull apart. And shit down your brain stem. Oh, now that didn't have to be added. No, I, <laughs> I don't know that it does all of that. But it is a great episode. Yeah. That's the, that's actually the first of our, uh, I don't know, will we call these celebrity podcasts? I guess we would, right? Sure. Or well, researcher. Sort of, I mean, in a way, I mean, do they, they, there is it a crossover? I don't know what it is. It's they've got a show, right, called The Devil's Advocate, and this That's is correct. sort of a, a branching off of that, yeah. a substream, a little, a little Devil's Advocate for Paratopia, an exclusive yeah. one-off. Yeah. So that, you you guys that are super into the uh, the ghost and hauntings phenomena, David Roundtree is, as far as I'm concerned, the Einstein of said topic so please listen in for that 
Yes. Uh, anything else? Anything going on in your, your life that you'd like to uh, share? No, the probes have continued. Um, the probes? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, wow, I don't know. Let me think on that for a second. Um, Nothing? <laughs> anything now? What about now? Now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, nothing going on for me. How about you? No, I don't think there's really anything that I need to share. We're, we're, <laughs> we're freaking the most two boring people on the planet. Yeah, I got I I have no, nothing nothing in my life. Um, although I did see I did watch this thing on National Geographic today that was about three different men. None they don't know each other. They're from different areas of the world who all believe that they are the second coming of Christ. Oh, nice. Yeah, one of them has no followers. He's just sort of uh, a crazy homeless man who made a lot more sense than the other two. The uh, one, uh, one of the th- three is a Jesus lookalike hmm. uh, who just sort of smiles and says platitudes and people follow him. And then the third guy <laughs> is like this, um, you know, Filipino, used to be an evangelist type and somehow d- discovered he's the second coming and now he's got, you know, this huge farm or really it's a town that he's building off the millions of dollars from his flock and um and you know they interview some of the followers of these people and they seem happy and all that and i I get to wondering about that and you had mentioned billy meyer and it's like surely these people are delusional or criminals or something um but so what like if everybody's happy does it really matter is it really any more or less delusional than believing in jesus in the first place at this point or believing that he's coming back uh, in the next 40 years, as apparently 41% of Americans believe, according to the latest poll. 41% of us believe that Jesus is coming back in the next 40 years. So, I mean, that's half the country almost. Are they all crazy? Yes. Are some of them wow. probably happy with it? Yes. So what do I care? <laughs> well, I uh, I would like to read a little email I've got here, if I may. Speaking of pleasant people... From one Michael Horn. Uh, (laughs) For the record, he says, the Paracast and UFO Watchdog have been among the leading suppressors of the truth about the Meyer case, and you bear enormous responsibility for the disservice you perform to humanity in favor of other rewards. Meyer, of course, warned extensively about the dangers of extracting petroleum, etc., from the earth. See 1976 transcript at 2006 in the first sentence substitute the word asia for the gulf and you'll see how little humanity has learned did i read that right yes you heard it right (laughs) substitute the word asia for the gulf i recently spoke at length with meyer in switzerland about many things including the ill spill and what is yet to come I must tell you quite sadly that discussing how to avoid the worst of the foretold events is now a closed conversation. We can't. We, humanity, missed the critical opportunities, and most of the prophecies are now predictions, i.e. certainties. Kind of like that Asia and the Gulf thing. (laughs) That's my uh, insert there. Uh, At some point, it may dawn on you and your associates what a disgusting negative agenda you have pursued to the detriment of all those you have influenced away from the truth. Don't bother to complain that you receive this. I won't be contacting you again. Which he says every time he sends you something. Well, well, I already sent the warning to his ISP again. But anyway, uh, <laughs> may I leave you all with that little note? Uh, you know, we're doomed, uh, according to the man who makes pie plates fly. Well, I'll tell you what's scary about that is the talk of um, there's nothing we can do. The conversation is closed. I mean, yeah. when I read that, to me, that sounds like... Like the Meyer camp is going to be closing their doors, and you know what happens when a cult closes their doors? Yeah, it's a little frightening, actually. Yeah. You know? They find uh, their space brothers in heaven. Right, right. Um, well, you know, but then again, Asia for the Gulf. So no need more to be said there. <laughs> uh, but I mean that that um, I don't know. It, it kind of it kind of for me. Anytime I read stuff like this, and I hear how. People are so certain of predictions of any kind, really. I think back to what Colin Andrews said at the last X conference was that, you know, if we believe that 2012 is going to hold horrors beyond imagination for this planet, then it will. And and if we stop uh, 
focusing on all this negative garbage that um, that that this isn't going to happen. And you recently sent me a uh, uh, a film, which we're we're trying to get this gentleman on the show. His name is Grant Morrison. He's a comic book writer, believe it or not, wrote The Invisibles, and um, he gave a fascinating, fascinating talk at the uh, what was at the Disinfo conference yes. of, of last year, was it or this year? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But uh, fascinating talk on sigils and uh, uh, and magic and and the power of thought and manifesting realities, hacking realities, as he called it. What are sigils, Jeff? Sigils are, well, like I'll explain it this way. This is how he explained it. You write down an intention on a piece of paper. I want this, or I want that, or I desire this. You remove all of the vowels. You then remove all of the repeated consonants. And you take all of those letters, and you basically put them together as a symbol of some kind. And this is the part where I get to make the joke about those, and you'll see the, f- the film will be linked to our message board. This is the part where I go, write this down for Christ's sake. For, for fuck's sake, write it down. Go home and do it. Um, because Grant gets really irritated at the crowd because they aren't writing this down. Um, uh, you Basically, you take those letters and you draw them up to, into a symbol and keep reducing it down until it looks magical. This is what he says. I mean, there is no wrong way to do this, as he put it. And by doing that, you're actually putting intention uh, into this symbol. Uh, and then you, you, that's it. You've done it. You've, you've actually uh, started the process that will, in his words, affect reality profoundly. And at the end of his discussion, the, the, the end statement that he leaves everybody with is that this kind of uh, practice it has been regulated to the occult uh, because no one else knows what to call it. So it immediately gets put into this thing of occult. It's an occult practice. And, um, and really what it boils down to is a lot of what we've talked about on the show, which is focus of intent, um, all of that sort of thing. And he says if everybody would do this, you could effectually infect the world with it to such a point that – there would be no us and them, as in them, the establishment. You would inf- you would infect the establishment to understand that you understand this. Uh, I mean, he explains it so well in this thing, despite the fact that he says he's he's pissed, uh, drunk, as as in drunk, and uh, and all of that. I mean, uh, he explains it very well, and, and he gives you some interesting examples of sigils in modern life and just what they mean. So uh, we'll have that link up on our message board. I encourage everybody to watch it because it's really great. We're trying to get him on the show. I did send him a letter, and we'll see if he bites. And if he does, there's our first special <laughs> for me and Jer to uh, to do an interview with him. I'd love to interview him. So, uh, yeah, check that out and see what you think. I'm curious as to what everybody uh, makes of that. He is certainly beyond convinced that it is real, that this is real, that you can really do this. And so... I've already tried it, and I'll let you know what happens. Yes, please do. Please do. Right. Uh, all right. I think that's just about all I got. Well, I guess I got one more little tidbit going back to just sort of cult speak. Um, I had talked to Deb Cobble earlier this week, and she told me that she went to one of the first Greer meetups of uh, Shining a Light in the Sky and Seeing a UFO uh, before he was big and famous. And before they did that, they were all in a room, and he dimmed the lights, and he began, um, in her words, a hypnotic induction, which she recognized from her uh, hypnosis work. So here's something good coming out of hypnosis. Uh, She recognized it, and so she jumped up, and she just left the room. She said, oh, oh, no, 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 he's not going to hypnotize me. And I felt like that was my... Her telling me that little story was my I, 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 moment of being really disappointed with the magic trick. Because I've always wondered how it is these these guys do this, you know, get starry-eyed believers to go and sing their praises in public and smile while they're doing it. Uh, and this may be it. So in this National Geographic special, uh, the, the, the dude who actually looks like Jesus, um, they had a psychologist analyze the video of him talking to his flock and the shrink basically noted that the way he speaks in a very sort of peaceful, clipped tones, uh, very soft, 
uh, is done specifically to draw people in, to force them to um, sort of narrow their focus. I mean, essentially, he ends up describing what sounds like a hypnotic induction. Uh, so I think that's it. I think that answers right. how all of these people, top to bottom, ply their craft. It's you hypnotize the folks, you, you tell them what they want to hear, <laughs> and then you tell them what they're going to see. And magically they see it. Right, right. I mean, so here, to me, the bigger question is, is when you have somebody like Anastradamus who, I mean, thousands upon thousands, I'm sure, people follow this guy uh, and and read his material and make either their own minds up based on what they read and interpret on their own or based on whoever writes a book about him. And they come up with these, I don't know, translations of their quatrains of, of what he's written, and they apply them to today's uh, events or future events. I have to wonder if that many people are focusing on that, thinking about that, thinking this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Is that part of the reason that things do happen. I mean, every once in a while, these guys do hit on something that's interesting. So you have to wonder how much of predictive events are actually uh, the power of focus and intent working at the same time. I mean, you know, when you're talking about somebody that, that's got that kind of following, I have to wonder. Yeah, I guess my final thought on all of that is I, I just wonder if some of these guys, you know, especially the the Filipino guy who started off as an evangelist, I mean, I wonder if they get it in their blood to, to do something like this. Maybe they start off as a con artist, but then they end up getting a giant following and forget the con and maybe start to believe their own press, start to believe they are some sort of um, godlike figure. I just wonder if that's uh, possible. I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure at some point you do start believing, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, so this gets back to like if, if, for- if that happens and everyone's happy, and no one's being conned at that point, then does it matter? Hmm. I don't know. I, I, you know, it always depends on what's going on in within these cults that I question, you know. Some people can say they're happy and, you know, it's getting hurt, but, you know, there can be some pretty horrible things that go on within these groups that, you know, you don't know anything about, maybe you don't hear about until it's too late. I was watching a documentary some time ago about, uh, just like you were talking about, some kind of religious... Uh, sect where they all live in a commune and it's very cult like and um, and everybody I think started out thinking I, I think this guy says he's Jesus or something like that and uh, everybody seemed happy until they found out that he was laying down with underage girls and all this kind of stuff and there was all sorts of pretty weird shit going on and I can't remember if he's been arrested or that his group has been completely disbanded by the law. Yeah, but I, I know that there were parents about. who had left the group, and the, and the children, some of the children stayed. I remember they were going back to get their daughter, and their daughter decidedly did not want to leave this place. So I, I don't know. I mean, you have to wonder what the mindset is of people who want to belong to a group like that in any case. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, I don't know what that speaks to. Um, whether it's just a, a need to belong or, or, or fear of the unknown. Well, the I, don't, I don't know, fear of the of, future. One of the followers of one of these Jesus guys was basically saying he's here to tell us what to do. You know, he's here to tell us how to live our lives right. and, and all of that. I mean, it was that sort of speech. It's like, well, right. so that's what you need. You need to be, why don't you empower yourself and live your life? I mean, right. that, that that's me just sort of yelling at my TV, but... Uh, but I, I mean, I think that's it, right? And isn't that what the what the power of religion is on the one hand? You know, telling you the best way to live your life, yeah. and yeah. you go do it, and you win. <laughs> well, every, everything I learned about life, I learned from Iron Maiden. So you know, and, and they they said the truth of all predictions is always in your hands. So <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, there's a. There's a joke in there for me, but I'm not going to take it. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wah, wah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Peritopia, we're done. <laughs> um. So one final time, thank you, Jody. Thank you, Dale Graff. Um, and join us again next week for Rourke and Roundtree, round two. Jeff, any parting words of wisdom? 
Have a good week. Very good. <laughs>